Good evening and welcome to Bent TV. In an extended interview tonight, Andy McNamara talks to Luke Williams about his book, The Ice Age, A Journey into Crystal Meth Addiction. Luke speaks frankly, providing detailed information as to what we may not have heard before and how a person is affected by such addiction. <laughs> Hi, I'm Andy McNamara. You are watching Bent TV. Today I am speaking to Luke Williams, who is a journalist who has just put out a book called Ice Age about his very interesting life. Um, Luke, welcome to Bent TV. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Now let's chat about your book. Let's chat about um, what what's the impetus for your book, maybe. Well, uh, I moved in with some uh, friends of mine who were living uh, in the outer suburbs of Melbourne in a place called Pakenham because I wanted to write a story about the Australian uh, underclass and the Australian working class because I felt that that was a good place to get stories that wasn't being done and was my edge because I've been a, a dodgy person, <laughs> semi-dodgy person since way back, who's known semi-dodgy people uh, since way back. Uh, and they were also addicted to drugs. They were also addicted to meth. And that I didn't understand because I thought we'd had meth in the country for a long time. So why are they suddenly losing teeth and getting scabs on their faces and robbing houses more than what they normally do? And uh, I used uh, drugs with them in the house, very quickly became addicted, descended into psychosis, masturbated for 16 hours at a time, started believing that a girl who came to the house was my ex-boyfriend who'd had a sex change operation told her very on very few occasion on a few occasions that I didn't like her shoes but everything about her looked normal that she could pass for a girl she didn't know what I was talking about so I had all these experiences <laughs> and realized when I got out the problem was is that from about 2011 onwards and this was in 2014 we had crystallized meth in in the country and the meth that we'd been using beforehand was powdered meth and that's where all the problems have arisen from uh -huh. So powdered meth we've had since about 1988 as our main stimulant. We called it speed for a little while. Come the early 2000s, we called it meth. And then this new drug, crystallized meth, is powdered meth turned into crystals. Right. And uh, this, is, this should be information that everybody has access to, I think, that's right. really hard to find and took yeah. me months to work all this out, uh, which is, uh, you know, about five times stronger, but can be up to 10 times stronger than powdered meth. But wow. we also called it meth, but it's virtually a completely different drug. So it needs to be approached with caution. I mean, there is a, there's a lot of craziness going on and obviously, yeah, this drug is the cause of it. Um, you, had a, you had a drug addiction history prior to that? No, no, no? yes, I did, I did, yes. No, where, where are you getting this stuff from? Crazy, um, no. It was a it was a brave and some might say stupid move to um, then who, who said that? go and closely associate yourself with drug addicts again. Um, are you suffering for your art? Is what's the? No, 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 no. It's not art. It's um, it's finding good stories and, and selling them. So it's um, well, what happened is is okay. Yes, all right. You put me on the spot. I did have a history of drug addiction. <laughs> Sorry about I that. I went to rehab in 2008. Uh, I've, I, I've sort of, uh, I have made a bit of a sort of public episode of all this, so it's okay to yeah, bring it all up. And uh, so I had, so I got bullied at high school because people were jealous of my looks, but no, actually because I was gay and I got caught a faggot and all that kind of stuff. I understand perfectly. And then I had really bad anxiety when I left high school. Uh, and uh, and I turned to amphetamines because I was kind of room bound otherwise. Mm -hmm. And am amphetamines have the effect of bolstering your ego and your confidence and reducing your anxiety. Right. And I abused, but then over time, it makes your anxiety worse. And it, so I got involved in an addiction cycle. I got over that. And then I worked at the ABC later life and I really wanted to be a radio presenter and I failed miserably at that around about the same time that I broke up with my partner. And I turned back to drugs then and I wound up in rehab in a place called Logan in, in Queensland. And ever, that was in, so that was start of 2008 and ever since then, my goal when I got out of rehab was just to use drugs every now and then and got, not get addicted and that's what I did. But because I'd spent so long in drug circles and hanging out with petty criminals and all that kind of stuff, um, they were always my circle of friends mm. and I always drifted back and forth between them and used drugs with them before. So do you call yourself now 
a former drug addict, drug addict or a recovering drug addict? Yeah, or... a former drug addict because, uh, you know, some people say, oh, you know, I'm always a, a, an addict. I think people say that because, so, so they know, I can't just have that little bit of drink because that way I'll, I'll completely lose it. Yeah, I was a drug addict, I'm not now. Um, and I've written, written a book about it, so it's all turned out quite kind of well, I guess. I moved in with them believing that I could um, just use drugs every now and then with them like I had, and it hadn't had a big impact on my life because it was powdered meth. Right. Powdered meth wasn't having a big, big impact on my life. I was using it, you know, once or twice a month. It wasn't affecting me. I wasn't getting addicted. I, you cannot do that with crystallised meth. It is a different substance, and it will probably cause harm. So in your book, you lived in that house and then you moved to another suburb of Melbourne, Footscray, and lived in a house, and there is just some totally insane, totally crazy stuff happening there. Are, and some of these people are people with children. Maybe you can ex explain some of the things, even the, the whole sort of ice face, like people are picking at their faces and yeah. it's just... There seems to be a belief that when somebody starts picking their face, it's because they think there's a bug under their skin. But that wasn't my what I saw. Um, you don't even realise you're doing it. It's like, I don't know, if you touch your skin enough, you find a blackhead or something or a lump there. And if you're on meth, meth stimulates, crystallised meth stimulates the part, same part of your brain as that, uh, that leads to OCD. It creates, you're just doing that, but it also leads to short-term memory loss. So right. not only are you doing that compulsively for you 30 seconds, realize. you don't remember the 30 seconds beforehand wow. until you go and look in the mirror and suddenly there's a lump there. Now, if, you, if you're not that off your face, you'll go, I need to stop playing with it. If you're really off your face and you've been doing that, you go and look at the lump and you go, in the case of this guy, Smithy, who I was living with, uh, he would go and then uh, look at that and go, something's wrong with my neck. And then he'll start squeezing it. And that's how it then becomes a big festering sore. And in his case, he had a very pretty one under his eye <laughs> that was leaking, that got about that big that actually pulled his eye in like that and was like a little vo volcano that was oozing pus like wow. that. And he had to, and he kept on, and we were all very confused at the time about why that was happening. From what I've read, um, crystal meth addicts having, having doing these things to their faces is actually quite common. It's, he, he's not a unique case by no, any means. So. No, and they think that, they don't realise they're causing those scabs. They think that Something's, uh, something's happened and, and there's kind of healing it by playing. Talking about short-term memory loss and losing track of time and not quite knowing what you're doing, you, you referred briefly before to your 16-hour wank. Can you elaborate somewhat on that? Sure. You thought you were in your room for one hour. That was that's yeah, how I read it. Yeah, and the short-term memory loss, the obsessive behaviour, the, um, the uh, stuff you normally fantasise about with a bit of an edge, and you kind of go, oh, that's, that's, oh, that's, yeah, no, all right, I like that. And, uh, and then it kind of gets a little bit sort of even creepier than normal. Uh, and then it just takes on a life of its own. And it's like someone's just turned on a movie and they know exactly what your tastes in porn are. And they've just gone, okay, but we're going to take it just a little bit further. You know, if you like rough sex, then there's going to be a bit of blood now. And you'll be like, oh. Oh, like, like excited and it's like, yeah, and you're like, and then, and then you're still not ejaculating. So then you go, what next? How about like, how about a finger in the urethra? <laughs> you know, you just kind of, and then, but you would never do that, and you would never normally fantasize about it. But it would be in the same general context of, I don't know, you know, dirty old men with twinks or something like that. But they're just taking things way too far, yep. and to the point where you know you, you finish masturbating, putting to side on the fact that you've been masturbating for 16 hours, that um, <laughs> that what you've been masturbating about, you feel like you need to go to the doctor about it because it's so dirty. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. And but they're just on a repetitive loop, and the the crystallized meth dries up your body fluids. Well, all amphetamines do that, but crystallised meth especially. So yeah. you've got the obsessive behaviour, yep. you've got the short-term memory loss, you've got the crystal meth does make you very imaginative from the beginning and you have these movie-like fantasies about all sorts of stuff. Uh, and then you've got uh, an inability no to fluid. ejaculate. And that's how it all happens. Wow. Um, and you do it enough times and it just seems like it's normal and, and I can't believe the reaction, I'm like, you masturbate for 16 hours. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> what's wrong with that?
So the next step on from that, psychosis is a common uh, outcome of people mm. who have addictions to crystal meth. Um, I read in your book, I think, five times the normal uh, incidence of a, of a non-crystal meth user. What are some of the situations and examples you've seen? Well, it starts off as fantasy and, and you realise that you are, you kind of know that you, you're in a fantasy world and you kind of don't. But the whole relationship with crystal meth and why people use it is all about fantasy in general. As soon as you take it, you reimagine yourself, you reimagine what people around you are thinking about, uh, you, you project that they're thinking, oh, gee, he's great, and gee, he's good looking, and gee, he's smart, and I want him to dominate the conversation for the next eight hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> and those, so it's all about fantasy from the outset. Uh, it's a lot about sexual fantasy. It's about fantasies of believing you've achieved more than what you have, or fantasies about believing that the only reason you haven't achieved things is because people have set you up and conspired against you. Nothing really happens by accident. So there's a mild psychosis from the outset, and then um, you just have these creeping thoughts, normally after you haven't slept for a day or two, uh, and your anxiety levels are up, and you start to think about things like, my mum hasn't contacted me in two weeks. What about that person who was looking at me funny in the cafe the other day? Um, my roommate just screamed at me because I've been smoking all these bongs and not giving him any money. Why is all this stuff happening? Uh, must be connected in some way. Uh, I've also got sores on my face. Why is this? There's something on my teeth. Um, I haven't shaved in. I haven't shaved recently. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> shaved in a month. Why is? And and you just put everything together into one theory, and you go, people are poisoning me, or. Um, you know, people have secretly, why is it that that friend stopped talking to me around about the same time that I break up with my ex? They must be together, but he's heterosexual. Oh, what they've done is, is they've turned my ex-boyfriend into a woman uh, and they've kept it secret from me and now they're playing a joke on me and rubbing in my face by having this girl come into the house knowing that it's my ex and playing this joke and they're all laughing about it in the next room. Uh, so, wow. So, and... Uh, these are memory potholes in between uh, that, that makes it hard to describe, but it's about taking fantasies literally. It's a break, breakdown of fantasy and reality, and it's a very infantile state where you think the whole world revolves around you in some way. What are the effects after you've managed to shake your addiction and got back to a normal life? What are, are there long-term after effects? There are, not, an not physically. For me, there was a couple of weeks where I felt a little bit lethargic, but... Uh, you spent a lot of time awake, you spent a lot of time thinking in a different way, and it can reset your thinking patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, and you tend to be uh, not mad, raving, lunatic, psychotic, but just kind of you at your worst for a long time. And unless somebody picks you up on that, that can just become your kind of new you. Uh, you know, you think about your defense mechanisms, whether you're a very self-centered person or a very aggressive person, uh, those tend to come out. I mean, for a while when I was on the drug, I became very grandiose and believed I was going to become a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> but can I just say that the thinking was Australia doesn't have a gay rapper and there are gay rappers. So I just would like to take this opportunity to say if you're a, if you're a young person thinking about getting into a music career and you're gay, maybe being a gay rapper is, is for you. But it wasn't for me. But that belief subsisted for months after I... I stopped using and if anybody criticised that I'd be like you always do this you always put me down you never give me any support just because you're gay just because I'm gay you think I can't be a rapper all this stuff but it was just grandiose adolescent fantasisation like you do when you're 13 you put the headphones on and you imagine you're a pop star What's the attraction to start using crystal meth? The attraction depends very much on the person I think part of it is is the loneliness that we have now in, in the breakdown of all sorts of communities. Yep. So it brings people together. As soon as you know somebody else is a drug user, then you can say, yep, we doesn't matter about anything else, where we come from in life, you, you immediately have that connection and you've immediately got something to do together. And then you know that you're gonna spend, you're gonna have somebody to hang out with for the next couple of days. There's a ritualized aspect that I found in using needles with people, that you're all getting together and sharing this process and breaking blood together and a lot of people are also using it to get work done because it is okay. has been used historically as a way for labourers and for working class people to be able to work through illnesses and continue working. It's great factory line job work, you know, repetitive, 
you don't feel the full gamut of emotion, you get a lot done, and, uh, and, you, and time flies. If someone is a crystal meth addict, what do you do? Where do you go? What's the, both, both if you're the, the addict yourself or if you know someone who is, what, what do you do? The problem is if you're in the midst of a crystal meth addiction then you've probably gone psychotic uh, it, 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 on varying degrees. You've lost your mind and it's hard to... The nature of losing your mind is that you don't know you've lost your, your mm -hmm. mind. Um, but then you'll have periods where out of pure exhaustion or because you can't get enough money or things have fallen apart or you've been thrown out of your house because you've been saying weird stuff where you just won't get access to the drug. And that in some cases gives people enough time to clear their mind and then make a proper choice mm -hmm. about yep. uh, whether or not they can continue using. Uh, if you know somebody who is an addict, uh, ultimately, I mean, it's a diminished choice, but ultimately they will make a choice about whether or not they will continue using in some way or another. Um, that, that, that is the life that, that, that they are choosing, but please understand that the, that the way they're behaving when they're on the drug is not them, even though it may seem like an extension of them or them at their very, very, very worst. It's not them. There was a time when I thought, as I said, people were poisoning me and so I started threatening to kill people. Uh, and some people never quite got over that. But I'm just like, I'm but just... I thought I was being poisoned. Yep. Um, and I have also wanted you dead for a long time as well. No, 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 no. But, you know, you, you have all these things that come out that, that aren't you. Um, and the only thing that would stop that would be a high dose of um, antipsychotics. Uh, and, and to be able to speak to that person when they hit rock bottom, yep. when they've cleared their mind enough, right. because there's no point trying to talk sense in them when they're in the midst of addiction because they've gone crazy, they've gone tropo, there's nothing you can do about it. talk specifically about the queer community mm. I've got a friend who is a lesbian and she had a drinking problem a few years ago and she runs a, a gay former addicts group like you know Alcoholics Anonymous sort of thing for for various gay people with addictions and there's a number of um, gay men and lesbians in it and all of them are off their their drinking or whatever it was except two guys who are crystal meth users who keep using and they um, and she rang me up and said oh these guys in my group keep using and um and they say oh all gay men always have crystal meth before they have sex. Mm. Is that true? I said, what are you talking about? It's the kind of justifications you hear from people all the time who want to keep on using. It. Yeah. Um, and it makes you deluded, it makes you lose track of reality and then that makes you lose more because you come up with stranger and stranger justifications about why you need to keep on using it. I mean, it's a bit like my friends who work in corporate jobs and they use it as well. Wow. And they say, oh, I'm just using it every now and then. And, it's, and I'm not going violent or psychotic. No, that's, most people don't. Most people who, not psychotic in a big way, most people get depressed and anxious when they use it. That's the bigger problem. Uh, and you may not notice those things. But uh, in terms of its use in the gay community, yes, yeah. I understand that people are uh, using it to have sex. Um, if they want to have sex for 18 hours, and, and I imagine that they're, they're um, having, living in a fantasy world while they're doing it, that there's no intimacy, that there's no love, that it's a way of uh, escaping. Um, if they want to do that, then um, good luck trying to have sex without it in the in the in the future, because uh, it will become very hard for them to be able to have any kind of sex mm -hmm. and, and enjoy it without using crystallized meth. For me, uh, uh, you don't have because you're not feeling the full gamut of emotions and you're just OCD and in a fantasy world and you're just aggressive uh, and seeking to break taboos in your own mind, uh, you, you're missing out on the affection, on the, on the love, on the talking, on, the, on the, the hand holding and all that kind of stuff which, uh, so, so you miss out on a lot of intimacy and you'll have trouble doing that again if you continue to have sex on crystallised meth. What's your future, and I mean both in your life and in relation to drugs? Well, I've given up drugs 100%, uh, but I still smoke marijuana occasionally if it's around, if I'm at a party or whatnot. Uh, because uh, writing this book helped me understand drugs more. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and I've done every drug under the sun, uh, and that's enough. <laughs> There's nothing more that drugs could possibly give me, and I hate the person when I'm on on crystal meth. So that's, and I've, oh, I don't want to say like such a wanker, but I went to like a silent meditation retreat and I read up on Buddhism and I practice Buddhism now. <laughs> and uh, yes, I know, I know. It's appalling, isn't it? It's worse than being a, an intravenous drug user, but that's just where I'm at at the moment. And I uh, pray to a Buddha and all that kind of stuff, uh, but I'm still an arsehole, you'll be pleased to know. So I haven't, completely I haven't completely taken on all the teachings. Great to know. Uh, but that's helped me a lot, and so I spend most of my time living in Thailand now, where I alternate between going and practicing in Buddha and going and seeing sex shows down in, the, cool. uh, down in Boys Town. But where drugs are super, super cheap. Yeah, but it doesn't interest me at all now. It really doesn't. I have moved on, and because I, but I get to write full time for a living now by by prostituting my life like this. I've been able to now write full time, so um, that's just a great life because I can live wherever I like, and I just get to roll out of bed at eleven o'clock every day. <laughs> I mean, I write all night, but um, I love my life. And who would? I'm so lucky, and 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 uh, yeah. Why would I need to take drugs? You know, because I just love life, love it, love cool. it, love it, love it. James Freud of the models um, had an alcohol problem for a number of years. He died a few years ago. And he wrote a book called um, I'm the Voice Left from Drinking, which is a line from his song Barbados. Um, a bell about how he'd given up drinking and blah, blah, and did a big tour and promoted it. The whole time he was drinking more heavily than ever. And then he wrote another book like a year later called I'm the Voice Left from Rehab about how he had still been drinking when he'd supposedly been through rehab. Do you find it's hard for people to trust a former drug addict and, and um, do you find people, some don't believe you? What's the... I don't really have a lot to do with people. <laughs> so most <laughs> of my friends have been drug users. I've always struggled to be able to have a connection with someone who didn't have, who, who's not a drug user. I mean, I went to a writers festival event last night and the people I immediately gravitated towards were people who seemed like they had been drug users and that they all said, yes, I would use intravenous drugs at some point in our lives. And so we just stuck together for the, for the night. Um, and that has just been the way, I, I don't know why, but people say that to people who have been through rehab. It is that connection, is that, it is that nice part when you give up, is when you know somebody else has been a, a problematic drug user, it doesn't matter what walk of life they come from, then you have that connection. So, but most of the time now, I just hang around with, um, you know, younger Thai men who don't really speak English. So, <laughs> so, so they don't understand that I've been a drug addict. Cool. You know, and I just uh, don't. I, I've tried telling them; they just giggle, but they giggle at everything <laughs> I say. So, do they understand or not? I don't know. So, how long have you been in Thailand, and, and what is your life there? Well, I've been going there on and off for about 18 months and from there I've gone through, because I lived in Kathmandu for six months as well to write this book, at, because it's so cheap there, um, and went to India and I spent time living in Indonesia and I spent time living in Vietnam and I'm going to Manila in two weeks. Mm. Um, and during that awesome. time I've like grown into uh, Asian guys, I've never been into them before. But being in, but I've always liked short, dark, kind of girly men, and so it's just like, well, why didn't I think of this earlier? Because you know, supposedly they're unpopular on the scene and whatever. So I was like, oh, if I had just known this earlier, if, you know, other people don't want them, then it's their, it's their, you know, they're missing out. And um, yeah, there's some beautiful looking um, Asian boys around, and uh, so I've been enjoying that and reading up on different things, but basically just living cheap, so I can spend full time uh, on my writing and getting better at it. And you can get better at it if you work on it every day, bit by bit by bit. Uh, and also working on my next book, which is all about uh, extreme Asia and uh, yeah. having extreme experiences in Asia. Thank you. I've been Thank speaking you. with uh, Luke Williams. He's the author of Ice Age, a new book about his trip into crystal meth and out again. Thanks so much, Luke. Thank you. It was great talking to you. Pleasure. You're watching Ben TV.